Well, uh, there are a couple of issues. Uh, in, in the US these days, it seems among the working or talking classes, there seems to be an idea that China is in great shape and getting greater and is going to be an economic uh, powerhouse, whereas I have the impression it's in real trouble. Um, Amon probably has, has a better impression of this. Is. And secondly, um, I was under the impression that um, China was having some of the same problems the U.S. has had, a thoroughly infiltrated political class that, that in some ways has, is opposing the uh, initiatives and the direction that Z wants to, seems to want to throw the country in, uh, that political class working with much of the um, U.S. political criminal families, sorry, um, uh, to undermine those sorts of things. Do you want to comment on that or, or talk about it? Well, two things there. Um, firstly, what is it that makes you think that they're economically in, in trouble? Well, there's this, this um, major bankruptcy mm. of late. Evergrande. And, mm, yes, yeah. exactly. And the, the numbers in there are, are just staggering. And I don't know, uh, various commentators or various others would say that's going to present a huge problem yeah. to the Chinese going forward. That's because they don't understand the Chinese financial system. Firstly, you're, the fact that the American economy and the Western economies are going down, COVID, trade tariffs, the supply chain things, they've all hit China hard. And we've seen a lot of bankruptcies. There's Evergrande being perhaps the most high profile of that. But the economy keeps soldiering on. I mean, what you've got to bear in mind, and I'm sure Matt has explained this, in China, they have public banking. The bank is there to serve the society and the economy as a whole, rather than the other way around. Does China have debt? Hell yeah, it has debt, but it's internal debt. If you're part of the Rothschilds banking system, any country that wants to raise money that wants to, it's got to go to the central bank with a bond and that boat can be sold internationally so now every country in the world is straddled with foreign debt china doesn't create its money like that china has a public banking system so china can do anything it wants all right it's got even the west says this they've got more tools in the toolbox to address these situations and they have when your debt is strictly internal, there's a million different things that you can do about it. So if you want to look at Evergrande, now Evergrande is a great example. Evergrande is a big, powerful uh, construction company. They build developments, mainly housing, and they've been very, 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 very successful. The mistake Evergrande made is like a lot of people in business, they think they have golden balls and they can turn it to anything. So they decided unwisely to get involved in the electric car business. That's where they lost their money. So anyway, they've got a cash crunch. They go out of business. She comes in, all right? And she says, houses are for living in. They're not for speculation. Any Chinese citizen that paid money to Evergrande to buy an apartment, they're going to get them exactly what they paid for. The government will ensure that. And bear in mind, Evergrande has got assets. There's no derivative trading in China. So, the, you know, the debt, it's not like the subprime mortgage where, you know, maybe you had $50 billion worth of defaults and that spiraled into trillions because of derivatives. They don't have that problem in China. Uh -huh. Okay, so the debt was as it stands. But what he said is, all right, if you were an investor in the stock of Evergrande, that's too bad, you lost your money. That's the way it works. And he famously said, I get judged on what I do for the Chinese people, not the stock market. So that's not it. There's no great contagion now. You know, it's, it's, it's an isolated issue and they handled it exactly the right way. If you look at 2008, where you know the government had to go in and bail all these banks out 
Now, even in England, when they bailed out the Bank of Scotland, they went, OK, if we're bailing you out, then the British, if the British people are bailing you out, then the British people own your bank. And to this day, the government or the people own 85% of the Bank of Scotland. That never happened. It was like, oh, so you went crazy and like, you know, coke fuel binge and you ran up all these debts, you know. No, we'll give you some money so you can keep going and do it again, which, of course, they did. There's a complete difference. But none of those assets that were bought, you know, essentially were American taxpayer money were nationalized. You know, that was a ridiculous thing about it. So, yeah, if you look at how China finances its infrastructure projects and how essentially it silos them so there's no contagion. Yeah, yeah China's gonna, China is experiencing an economic downturn. And it's experienced, it's lost a lot of businesses uh, because of all the last couple of years, disrupted cash flow and everything, but it will rebound. It will rebound very, very, very quickly, but its financial system is in very safe hands because it's internal. So that was the first part of the question about Evergrande and, you know, the financial right. system. If you don't understand which most of the West don't, China's banking system, you know, they're going to say, oh, it's going to crash. They've got all these debts and that sort of thing. No, it doesn't work like that. They're aware of that, you know. And it isn't like one big pool, you know, where all the debts go and the money gets paid out. All of these infrastructure projects, they're all isolated. They're all treated as a separate entity. They all have a, you know, a cost and return format. Yeah. In them. They know what they're doing with that. They really haven't made too many mistakes. But, you know, once you give the market over to, you know, the free market, then these sort of things are going to happen. But they'll have learned from their mistakes. What was the second part of that again? It was about, um, I, uh, I've heard. Oh, right, the factions. Right, the factions. Yeah. Every country in the world has got them. I mean, that's right. the first thing. So, yes, you do have factions. Um, but the party itself, they're united. Now, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Don't let anybody tell you any different. We don't. But I'm of the opinion, particularly when it comes down to leading political figures, it doesn't matter what they profess to think or what they believe in or what they say. The only thing that matters is what they do. Right. And if you look at the way the Chinese party goes now, the Chinese party have always had to battle with attempts at oligarchy. Let me clumsily put it in that manner. So, for example, Jack Ma, um, who's the CEO and the genius of uh, Alibaba, we're all familiar with him? Yeah. Ugly little troll guy. Yeah. Okay, well, he's, he's like the Bill Gates of... China, okay, but he doesn't own Alibaba. He's a he's a construct. Alibaba and that group, they're owned by the Jiang family out of Shanghai. J I A N G Jiang. They're a very very rich and powerful old Shanghai family that survived generations of different changes and governments and all sorts of things. Very powerful. Alibaba is a front for them. Now, early 2000s, Jiang Zemin, one of the scions of that family, was the president of China. And he showed disturbing signs of being too sympathetic to Western interests. Jack Ma works for them. He's their mouthpiece. Now, they were about to do an IPO about 18 months ago uh, in Shanghai. It was going to be trillions. And Jack thought himself so powerful that he came out and criticised the Chinese banking system. Okay, Jack. That's what no, caused that. No IPO, all right? And Jack yeah. was quite to advise to keep your mouth shut and go and live quietly on your money. I hope it keeps you warm. China is battle as the same battle against oligarchy. Um, it's trying to avoid that influence. Now, Matt has pointed out, I mean, we have incidents of Western penetration through um, the attempted colour revolution in Tiananmen Square, which was nothing like it was reported. I was in Beijing at the time. 
So they've always had insiders, these people that wanted to move more to the Western neoliberal, you know, camp. And yeah. it's fighting against those. She's speech at Davos and there was other party uh, conferences where they spoke about the danger of the power of the capitalist class. So there are factions, but they're united. And China's quite capable and has a history of purging senior people who are guilty of this. It's about 10 years ago, and there was the mayor of Chongqing, Guo. And uh, Guo was a very popular guy. Chongqing has got a population of about 36 million in central China. And he was seriously considered as a candidacy for the premiership. But they were doing all kinds of dirty dealings with the West. And there was an English businessman, an old Etonian and Ox Oxford guy, who was actually supposed to be quite close to them. He was their money launderer. Anyway, he didn't go along with some sort of plan and Guo's wife had him murdered. This was a very famous case. So they were purged and went to prison and everything. So yet China has factions. If you look at Xi, Xi's family are kind of like a Beijing equivalent of, uh, Jiang, of the Jiang family from Shanghai. Again, a very old, powerful political family. They own the Wanda group in China. And the Wanda group, they're big in like property, shopping malls, cinemas. Uh, they own the big uh, movie studios. So you have competing factions, which is to be expected. Yeah. And I'm sure that's the, the case in Russia. I mean, like all the oligarchs know not to mess with Putin, but he has to deal and juggle because a lot of these people, A, weren't purged you know they went along with him at least on the face of it and the other thing a lot of these oligarchs they are actually nationalists yep. they actually do care about russia so um yeah they have factions in china but they've got a united front china's system of government is an understood it's not a dictatorship it's not a tyranny it is a, it is a technocracy you know, we have a political system that is destined to throw up the very worst of humanity to run us. It's just the nature of things. They have a political system that's geared towards producing the exact opposite, which is the best and brightest. You know, for 2000 years to be able to sit the civil service exam and be a government official was the highest accolade anybody could aspire to. So. China is run by very, very, very committed and very intelligent people. And that's obvious when you see them with their Western counterparts. They look like the adults in the room. Yeah. So China's got some financial issues. Yes, the economy is going to dip, um, but it can handle it. And there's not going to be any single event like an Evergrande or something that's going to set off this explosion. Because what blew up, you know, in 2008 was the derivative market. It wasn't the property market. Does that answer your question, Doug? Yeah, no, that's fine. Exactly. Because I don't have the, the, the breadth of uh, input in that, in that market and in that, certainly in that geopolitical area to, mm -hmm. to know all of the things that are going on. And so yeah. you hear and you wonder what's going on. Yeah, well, it, unfortunately, look, I mean, the, the problem is um, most of the, the people that are talking about China are not qualified to talk about it. You know, it's as simple as that. Yeah, just regurgitating things that they've heard. And I appreciate your questions because it goes to the heart of it. And I'm doing a talk tonight, which will um, cover China. And Matt, who asked the question, who was on first, he's going to, actually do an introduction and give my background. Now, I really don't care what people think of me. I don't need the affirmation, but I'm going to insist if you have somebody that's going to stand up and talk about China, find out what qualifies them to do it. Yeah. You know, and getting your talking points from some of these right wing institutes like the Hoover, the Atlantic Council or what you read in Fox News, they're not authoritative sources. So I'm actually, I'm so happy that you that you 
ask that question, Doug, because that is something which is just so uh, big in the zeitgeist. And I'm actually going to like snip out your answer, Amon, and just make that a standalone video since I think a lot of people need to uh, process what you just said. Um, Because again, you know, like, like we were saying, there's often this problem of projecting our own uh, foibles onto the other. And that's often what's happening here, where certainly if an Evergrande type situation were to arise here in our backyard with our entire post glass Steagall universal banking complex of derivatives, toxic waste, you know, holding everything together, it would blow up. It would, it would destroy the ship. Whereas in China, they they have a contained system. Yeah. I mean, that's going to happen. I mean, it's some sort of black swan event could tip the, well, the Western economy over the brink, you know, literally overnight. Um, It's the, the Western economies have been running on fumes for at least 20 years. Yeah. The, the European Central Bank can't sell its bonds. It's got to buy its own bonds back. And the Fed has been doing that since 2008. Yeah. There's no takers for the bonds. So the Chinese market, they've, they've guarded it. They've protected it against the Western neoliberal banking system. I mean, in, we all remember Japan. Japan had a system that wasn't too different from China, but some of the same principles were there. It was a political economy. They controlled and directed, you know, the central bank about where investment was going to go. So it was very much more state controlled capitalism, you know, than the Western model. And they became so successful that they had to be destroyed. The Asian financial crisis was deliberate. It was triggered to destroy Japan, which it did. They attacked the Thai economy first, you know, and uh, it's not difficult for them to do it when they start shorting currencies and set off the chain of them. And they did it. Once the Japanese economy uh, crashed, then they moved in with a neoliberal agenda. And then all of a sudden you saw all this frivolous spending and like, you know, people borrowing trillions of yen and buying, it it just got ridiculous. They destroyed Japan and it hasn't recovered. They imposed neoliberalism on it. So the the Chinese protect their financial system. Okay. Uh, And it's, it's, it's pretty much immune to Western attack. Okay. You get over here, the, 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 um, oligarchy controlling the media and other sources for information over here uh, project uh, issues in, in, in Russia and, and China um, that probably are reflective of the conditions here, but um, do not necessarily give you any information in terms of how those countries handle their own issues. Mm. And, and so you, you, it is a, uh, it's a form of uh, deflection, if you will, in my view. And, and and they do that well. They do that to take attention away from things. I mean, the entire uh, fake RussiaGate thing during Trump's presidency. All of it is just to take attention away from things going on elsewhere. And uh, I, I think that the, much of the uh, issue, for example, Evergrande was supposed to be a black swan event. Well, that never happened, did it? No. No, but if you manage your own economy and you're doing it responsibly, then you don't link one thing to another so you avoid contagion. It's an isolated incident. You know, there's no contagion in any other sector. You know, it, it crashed for a business reason. It wasn't any market forces. It crashed because it made a very bad decision to get into yeah. a business, a very capital intense business, which it knew nothing about. But you touch on another good point there, Doug. Why don't people understand this? If there's, if there's one overriding reason why the West hates China, it's because they're a very bad example. Because they've got a political a system, a political economy that works. It works for everybody. That's the point of it. It's a bottom-up economic model, not a top-down model. And that's the example that the rest of the world are flocking to because they've seen what China has been able to do with that. It's a better system. Well, that's the problem with America. It's a bad example. 
They don't like bad examples. They didn't like Saddam Hussein decided to sell his oil in Euros. Yeah. Right? Fortuitously, we discovered he also had weapons of mass destruction. And, you know, so oh, on yeah, moral right. grounds, they destroyed the country. You know, they don't like the example of Gaddafi deciding that he wants to be paid in gold for his oil and launching the gold back Dina. They didn't like the fact that Gaddafi was running like the largest infrastructure project in Africa, you know what I mean, with the oh, Ecuador to bring war. They don't understand any of that. He did more for Libya than, than was had been done in the U.S. since they made the Tennessee Valley, Tennessee Valley Authority. I mean, he was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the point about it is, and I mean, this comes down to the system, is trying to understand. I mean, America is falling apart. The last time America did any worthwhile infrastructure was the Tennessee Valley Authority under FDR. And they only managed to do that because he used public banking. Yeah. Since then, the only thing you could say was a massive infrastructure project was the Highways, uh, the Highways Act under Eisenhower. Yeah. They were building the internet highways. But the only reason that went through was because the Rockefeller interests thought that was a great idea to have people driving everywhere. Since then, they've done absolutely nothing. Now, how does China, how does, why did China manage to build infrastructure and what is its model as opposed to the West? Well, firstly, the reason why you haven't got any infrastructure in America is the same reason there isn't an industrial plan. Okay. Firstly, it's all private capital. So if you want to build a bridge in America, okay. Private capital comes in, the bridge is, you know, big suspension bridge is going to cost $8 billion. What's the return on the investment? Well, you can collect the tolls. Okay, that's great. But, 40 years. Well, yeah, but here's the point with it. Firstly, the return on that investment is A, too small for the capital class, yeah. and it takes too long. So if there's not a bucket in it for these assholes, it doesn't get done, and that's why nothing gets done in America. Okay, because it's got to suit the financial class, otherwise forget it. In China, now I, I give an example of this. So the capital class, they can only look at an investment, uh, at an infrastructure project in terms of what is the direct ROI, return on investment. Yeah. They don't calculate anything else. So I give this example. In, in China, you've got Shanghai here, and then you've got the Yangtze Delta, which goes up. And on this side, you've got the Nantong it's a Peninsula that comes down, separated from Shanghai yeah. by the Yangtze. If you wanted to drive from Nantong, from Nantong to Shanghai, as the crow flies, about 40 kilometers. But in order to drive from Nantong to Shanghai or vice versa, it's about seven hours. You've got to drive up north and down the peninsula. So they built the Sutong Bridge. At the time, 15 years ago, it was the largest bridge of its type in the world about 15 miles amazing piece of construction how did they finance it okay well they issue a bond split jointly between nantong and suzhou on the other side nantong and suzhou okay they collect the tolls they pay the bond right does it pay for itself yes of course it does it might take 20 years but it pays for itself yeah, but it doesn't matter since it's done publicly. Uh, well, it's, it's not the point. I mean, even if you're producing public money, you can't produce it at zero interest. There's economic no, no, reasons but why. Take, but what you, can do, what you can do is have a low interest, non-compound rate. It's the compound interest that makes it unaffordable. Yeah. So they build the bridge. Sujo, Nantong, they're responsible for it. They collect the tolls. It gets paid. Takes a period of time, wouldn't in, in, interest private capital. Because private capital can only look at the tolls. It's the only return on investment. It's the only value it sees in it. But China doesn't. The state banking system doesn't. Because what they do is they say, look, 300,000 people a day now use this bridge. We're saving four and a half million hours a day. Yes. where people are not sitting in traffic, they're not burning fuel, they're not calling, causing pollution. And they can take those four and a half million hours a day and put them to some fruitful pursuit. 
The GDP on both sides of the bridge have gone up exponentially, which they could calculate. New business has been created, efficiencies have been generated, and it's had an overall positive effect on the GDP. That matters to China, that matters to Su Tong, and that matters to Nantong. It doesn't matter to the private investor, he gives a shit about the GDP, he doesn't see a dime out of it. So it's a different mindset. Once that bridge is paid for, the bond is retired, and now you've got a bridge for life that's collecting money all right, and driving efficiency. And since that bridge, they built about another four and half a dozen tunnels under the Yangtze. So the model of financing, and I mean, as Matt will be, this is very close to what you know the Hamiltonian system is. That's how you get things done. The reason why they've got a thriving economy is because the banking system is there to support and enable the economy and the society, not the other way around. Right. You know, people say that, oh, the Chinese state sector, they've got an unfair advantage, they're competing. Like, no, the Chinese state sector is domestic. It's infrastructure, it's education, it's, it's the banking system, you know? They have a state sector, but it's companies like Sinopec, the biggest company in the world. They import, refine the oil, they own the, the oil station, so they can control the price of oil. It's a state sector com uh, company because it's essential to the infrastructure of the society. But its primary goal is not to make a profit. It didn't give it away. You pay for your petrol, but they take the profit motive out of it. You take the profit mo uh, motive out of it, and there's a million different things that you can do. But the profit motive, the financialization of every aspect of life in America, is, is completely destroyed by financialization. If you look at America, I mean, you know, the CDC, National Institute of Health, OSHA, these are all private regulatory agencies. The ambition statement is to run as a corporation and make a profit, like the Federal Reserve. They're not there to serve the common good. So like when you've got all these private regulatory agencies, I guarantee all you're going to have is more and more regulation, which is an unfair burden on the small and medium-sized businesses. You know, they can't, they can't handle it. The big right. businesses can, they can just build it in. So privatization and the financialization of every aspect of human life is part of the lot of the western you know of our western system they're aware of that in china you know some things are just too important to be all about money this is a perfect this is a perfect way to wrap it up i think what the point you just drove home with is wonderful i'm going to make that whole thing a standalone little mini class unto itself and i'm going to deploy that one especially far and wide a very valuable little weapon that you gave people intellectually there especially but the whole thing was meaty with insights and wonderful wonderful composition overall and i really appreciate you taking the time and sharing with us uh i hope we get to do this again as a follow-up sooner than later and uh I'm, i know that there's a lot more of your uh, your life experience that you could you could throw out at us at some point soon so Amon, thank you so much and have a great meeting tonight. About me, the better. Yeah, thank that'll you. be great. And um, I, I must say, I mean, um, friends of Matt and Cynthia, you know what I mean? That's a highly educated audience you've got there. I'd be delighted to talk to any of you again at any time. It encourages me to know there are people like you out there, you know? Feels and, better. Um, huh? It feels better to talk to people that can understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I well, look, I've been at this an awful long time, um, you know, a long time. And, um, you know, my hat goes out to Matt and Cynthia for the fantastic work they do. And, you know, I mean, I write a few articles and do a couple of these things, but, you know, my intent is really just to support their work as much as I possibly can. Um, because they're breaking new ground. And I mean, you're covering all the ambient issues um, that are facing us, you know? I mean, it's not one issue here, there's not one thing, you know? 
um, there's a number of things, but we have a, a very interesting point in history and we can actually influence what happens from now going forward. So be optimistic. We have uh, the evil empire is crumbling and we've got all kinds of opportunities here to the things that we can do. So thank you. Amen to that. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. It's been a distinct pleasure. The, the pun there was intended, by the way. What was that? Aim on to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, sure, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been my you, distinct man. pleasure. Matt, 